From there, it didn't seem like Otohan as a character was getting her point across to Imogen, so she decides to motivate her by killing her friends. Time almost stopping around her, her body begins crackling with this energy, her lightning as well. There's a decent chance they're not even dead. How's it going, guys? Welcome back to Fraud on the Telly. In today's video, we're breaking down the absolute madness that was last night's episode of Critical Role, an episode in which Matt Mercer brutally murdered two members of our party. As well, we got some pretty massive information on Imogen's backstory, as well as the story of Ruidus and everything that's going on in Campaign 3. As always, guys, don't forget to cast Save the Dying on that like button, as we'll follow up with a bonus action inspiration for the subscribe button. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to check out some of our other Critical Role content. Let's get right into it shall we usually i do like a plot through run through before we talk about the juicy bits of the episode but i think we're gonna do this pretty quick because this was a critical role first i can't think of another situation off the top of my head where we had two pcs killed in one encounter which is just like absolutely crazy so the episode begins where our last one left off with the raiding of the paragon's call by this unknown faction basically the group end up dispersing a bunch going down into the basement to get trashy saying this is our time right while laudna goes off and does her own thing and places the ring trashy's ring that they can track on to otahan basically the others go down they end up finding surprise surprise it was otana vo and apparently her group that is uh trying to get trashy for some unknown reason as well as they seem to be trying to get uh, the Dunamancy are preventing them from moving it. It seems like possibly the party was disrupting whatever was going on here. We don't really know because it doesn't really matter because some more crazy shit happened uh, a couple hours later in the episode when the group finally escaped with Treshi having made a deal with Otana Vo. Treshi's in their portable hole right now. He's probably dead, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> they escape and all of a sudden, when you think that they're out, they got their man, you know, for once our cast members did a plan effectively, it was a bit of a cluster, but it worked, when all of a sudden, um, the big bad evil guy steps up to the plate. Now, personally, I love in D&D when dungeon masters or campaign guides introduce a big bad evil guy early on when the characters are not like capable of handling it. Curse of Strahd does this really well. I think it introduces like a really cool, um, Kind of feeling and dramatic factor that overhangs like the whole entire story and i thought that's what this is going to be but it wasn't at all was it so this starts off okay otahan wants to talk with imogen and the party she obviously has some questions and doesn't seem too perturbed about them being a threat to her at all which we'll come to see why i gotta give matt credit here he really really kind of pushed the envelope on when the combat actually started uh he gave them a shot they had an opportunity right at the beginning where they could have unleashed surprise attacks they could have tried to flee instantly or they could have tried to like talk their way out of the situation right and they were too indecisive they really were he really gave them a way out it seemed like otahan wanted more information than to actually kill people even though she did seem to delight in the killing of people, Matthew. So Otahan is crazy strong. Her crazy mobility combined with her stats, combined with her ability to make these little mimics, shadow mimics, the ones that are the shadow assassins, which we come to find out are the same ones that Orem saw. Otahan actually has met Orem in the whole situation with uh, the shadow assassins in Keyleth. And yeah, she's super freaking strong. Who would have thought? So very quickly, this goes south because like we said, the plan was divided here, and because of that, there was a lot of people scattered on the map, which is not good when you're encountering a melee fighter like her. Ultimately, I think that if they were going to stand and fight, they should have tried to group and have their casters, you know, be safe. So that way she can't have isolated targets, so they can gang up on her with flanking. Uh, they could get attacks of opportunity if she were to move. I know the shades made that difficult, but... It seemed like a lot of the problem was the fact that Otahan literally could go from squishy caster to squishy caster and just fuck people up. She hits three times and her bonus to hit was pretty high. I don't remember what it was. And yeah, she just messes people up. And within a few turns, there was three party members down. From there, it didn't seem like Otahan as a character was getting her point across to Imogen. 
So she decides to motivate her by killing her friends. Real quick, guys, then we'll get back to the video. I just wanted to say that these videos are made possible and sponsored by you all. You, the audience. Yes, you. You all by watching this video, liking, commenting, subscribing, or supporting me on any of my other links, such as Patreon or donating to me directly, make these videos possible. So thank you so much uh, for allowing me to do this. It really does mean a lot to me. Well, guys, if you enjoyed the strange, spooky, the mysterious, and the unexplained, why don't you go check out our new project channel, Dr. Novus, where we do exactly that in storytelling format, at least one video a week. Go check it out if that's something that you seem interested in. Let's get back to the video. Orum goes down in this super tragic death. It was really tough, man. That one, I think, hit me more in the feels uh, than everything else in this episode. <laughs> Next to go down in permadeath is Fern, while Ashton and Chetney lay unconscious in the battlefield. Laudna, in an attempt to get Otahan to stop, tries to persuade her with information about the Moontide Crown and Ira, but Otahan has like Imogen mind powers times 10, and so she can just read their minds very easily, uh, learning that she is telling the truth, but she's also lying and withholding information. The whole entire time, Otahan is goading Imogen, trying to get her to release the power inside of her. Imogen gets some huge protag vibes in this episode, man. Imogen is literally set up here. It's kind of like a Sith Lord, like Jedi Padawan-esque apprentice where Otahan wants her to like unleash her inner potential, this dark side of inside of her. Fighting with these inner demons inside of her, Matt describes this like storm raging inside of her, this inner surge of power that she feels in her dreams, wanting to be released and come out. Giga main character vibes. As Otahan kills Fern, she looks to Imogen saying, you are so close. The more you run from it, the more you lose. There is greatness in you. Our fate is soon, embrace it or be culled like the rest. Now this seems to very much hint at the broader plans of Otahan and possibly whatever the heck is in the moon of Ruidus, these two missing gods, possibly. Now, the easy way to read into this is that Otahan wants to call anyone that's not Ruidus born. And even then, she seems to only value the strong Ruidus born in this culling. This is a motive seems a little bit weird because how the heck are you supposed to get allies on your side if your plan is to kill everyone? Because not everyone cannot be killed, right? I don't know. Hopefully we'll find out more in the future or when we make a theory video and I actually sit down and like really try to think about it. The storm continues to rage in Imogen's belly as she's basically watching her friends get slaughtered in front of her because like we said, they're all too spread out. It just allows Otahan to basically like two turn cycle a person, even one turn cycling some of the casters with her three hits because I mean, the guys, they're not that high a level, man. She can do 50 damage in one turn. That's scary. Finally, in order to get her message across, Otahan threatens Laudna, who is obviously uh, Imogen's favorite, getting the response she wants. But you see, Here's the thing, this is when the Sith vibes come in real strong here, Matthew. While Imogen decides to give Otahan what she wants in exchange for not hurting Lana, Otahan responds with one of the most edgy lines I've heard Matt say in a while. You don't get to choose when you give in. You let go when the moment is right. As she runs her blade through Imogen's best friend. Imogen has to make a wisdom saving throw. She gets a nat one, which is hilarious because over the course of the first half of the episode, the table was crazy hot. Like there was crazy nat 20s. There might've been like four, maybe five nat 20s in a row. Then I think there might've been almost like eight, nine nat 20s total on the episode. Super crazy, but you know, uh, the dice never lie. And that definitely deserved a one. Storm inside Imogen's belly finally erupts as she screams. She comes into the air. Suddenly, the dust storm all around her in this super, like, dramatic moment just stops. Time almost stopping around her. Her body begins crackling with this energy. Her lightning scars erupt with this crazy red light. All of a sudden, everything around them is just this red color like it's Imogen's dream almost this red storm just overtaking them and then this blinding flash of light happens and our episode cuts now what the f just happened where did they go what happened to the characters are they dead are they gonna come back who knows personally i think that those characters aren't actually going to be dead i mean they died they definitely died matt definitely killed them but is are they going to play new characters next episode 
I don't know. I, I personally, I don't think so. This seemed like a situation that Matt definitely accounted for. Like, when you're a DM, you have to try to account for multiple scenarios that will happen, especially in a combat like this, because Matt was going to have this standoff with Otahan probably no matter what in this way, especially once he saw how it was going uh, inside the Paragon's Call Fortress. So, in his mind, he could be like, okay, here's the scenarios. Outcome one, they managed to run away. Outcome two, they somehow kill her, which I don't think he would let happen because she seems way too important for them to die. Outcome three, Otahan is forced to run away. Outcome four, she TPKs the party. Outcome five, she gets what she wants from Imogen. This last outcome seemed to be the one that happened. This was what Otahan wanted. She was goading Imogen to do this the whole time to give in. This So Matt, the DM, obviously accounted for what was going to happen here. Did they get transported to Ruidus? That's a common theory that people are already speculating. Who the heck knows? How do we even know? Who knows? For all we know, they could wake up and everyone be okay. And I would be like, yeah, okay, I guess that makes sense. This episode was crazy. It's always nuts when player characters die, especially when they kind of happen so randomly. But as soon as this combat started, you could tell that this was some real sh**, and it felt like they took it a little too lightly at the very start, and that's kind of what cost them their characters, ultimately, in a way. All you can do is kind of learn from it and go from there. It's funny because there's kind of two sides to Matt as a DM. There's, like, brutal ah! DM Matthew Mercer, and then there's, like, the kind, forgiving, take mercy on your soul. Matthew Mercer. But I will say that even the most brutal of Matt Mercer encounters and things that he's done to players, I feel like it's not on the same level as like Brennan Brutal. And I've said this a lot in some of our videos, but since EXU Calamity, it really felt that like Matt actively took a lot of efforts to take stuff from Abria and take stuff from Brennan. This very much feels like how it played out, like something that he took from Brennan. Now, Matt's not ever afraid to kill player characters far from it in fact as we've seen but a lot of times with a show like this it does get the feeling like your player characters have plot armor in a sense i mean like the first half of that episode felt like super plot armory but that's because we were rolling so many 20s right as we've said already this could have gone a variety of number of ways i don't think this encounter was too hard by any means i don't think there's anything wrong with putting a very challenging uh foe in front of your players, especially when it's an important character serving a narrative function such as this one, who's arguably the most important character that we've witnessed so far, the closest thing to a big bad evil guy that we have. I don't think that was the problem at all. Um, I don't think that Matt needs to feel bad about killing any of these characters. This was because of actions that the players took and because of character motivation that the character had. As well, there's a decent chance they're not even dead. Uh, yeah, I think that about wraps it up. I've been rambling for a while now. This episode was absolutely crazy. I feel emotionally exhausted and I'm very tired. Credit to Matt. It's always hard when you have to kill player characters. It's not fun. It doesn't feel good, uh, even though he may have been smiling and laughing, you know, maybe while he did it. It doesn't feel good to do. It's very, very hard, especially when you have to, you know, kind of hurt a personal friend like that by taking their character away, but it's part of the beauty of D&D &D. as well. Um, Matt really tried to give them an out in this combat at the beginning. You can go back and watch it, man. Uh, he really tried to let them talk their way out of it or gave them time to escape if they came up with a good plan, I guess. And yeah, you know, that's how D&D is. The dice get rolled, choices get made, and we live with those choices. But that's why we play the game because personally, I think it's fun living with the consequences of my dumb actions. As always, if you enjoyed the video or learned something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Again, sorry I was so much rambly on this video. I'm very tired. Please go check out some of our other Critical Role content. And as always, guys, stay safe out there. Thank you for watching my video. I will see you in the next one. Peace, love. Adieu.